there's a great painting by uh, Bruegel of the fall of Icarus, right? And it's this huge panorama, a farmer tilling a field, the ocean, the woods, a tiny little splash in the corner indicates that, you know, this guy has fallen from the sky and has just demised, but you don't know it. It's a Tuesday, the, he's got to work, you know? And so this is how life occurs. Um, and that you kind of want, we're raised to believe there should be these big cinematic moments, and there are. But sometimes the way they happen is just so deadpan, weird, funny, um, and twisted that um, there's this just strange sense of humor to the universe. So I just, you know, loved seeing the world broken down into these dramas. I think art is a visual pattern. I think there's a huge variety of how that could manifest itself, and each artist solves that with their own handwriting uh, and their own mental framework. Seasonally, things happen in Maine that are very interesting um, after December. January, February, March, there's kind of a holding pattern. The light stays constant. Um, the days are short. Um, I, I call this pattern um, a season spent in self-hypnosis because that it occurred to me that's what was happening. But I wanted to work with repeats because I felt that I wasn't going to get to know what ideas I was working on until I'd done them enough that I really became comfortable with the world I was creating. And then I would understand better what detail it was of a larger room, that these are pieces. For instance, this pattern came from the background here, um, which I put that pattern in, I needed something there, put in a pattern, it was much too small because visually when you step back, uh, there's a kind of a distance with viewing that I wanted to register at. And so I had to paint it twice to get that pattern to register. And in painting it and scaling it up, I broke it out and decided, well, let me just work with that pattern and understand a bit better what's even happening because I started to notice that there was movement within the spaces that was occurring with where I put the color down and that it kept it started to change and so each time I do something with a repeat here positive ground negative ground color shifting um, this came as a background of a pattern of that painting over there in, in this section where I suddenly realized that I was beginning to articulate something so I think what happens, and it's an evolution over a couple of years, that um, you get an idea, work out a couple rough sketches, uh, start to do it in one context, realize you need to go off on what seems like a tangent, but that it needs to be expanded on, that you're, you've are you raised a question. It's like someone asking you, heckling you, if you will. And you have to respond to that, even though I often come into this room and say, I'm going in this direction today, and the room says, well, maybe not, and I find myself on a tangent that can last for months. Sometimes I circle around things just because I'm trying to figure out what do I mean, and I, I think that's a kind of a responsibility of a creator to at least know why you're doing something, or, or formulate the question, just a better why over the years. I, I don't have an answer, actually. I started writing about other artists as a tool to understand, um, to sort of uh, empathize with work that I was trying to figure out. It was also sort of pointed out that there was a need for artists to have a voice um, that to write not as a point of view of criticism, because I, I have a bone to pick with the concept of criticism is confused with there's critical thinking which is one kind of thinking and then there's negative thinking which is being critical and criticism can get confused with being critical of something so to write and think about things from a place that is from the point of view of an artist a sense of, I would go into an artist, maybe I didn't even like their work, quite frankly, to say, well, I don't quite get it. What am I missing? What is here? Where are they coming from? What formed them? And I like interlocking links to stories so that it's 
you're going in this direction and something intersects and then something else happens and then it folds back in. So in writing about art, I would find their influences and in other artists folding back into a narrative that would then become as much about writing as it is about art and as much about the artist as it is about life. All these things have to be navigated by questioning them. So writing uh, about art becomes a way of questioning art, uh, questioning the even the validity of art, which I think has to be done sometimes. Uh, because if artists don't question the validity of art, they will be subject to criticism, which is a negative critical thinking from people who question the utility because it's often intangible. And because it's intangible, you can't prove it. And because you can't prove it, it can be uh, dispelled if someone has bigger magic. I grew up in a family of educators. My father was a university professor. We had summers off. It was a time in America where, you know, a one working parent could support a family. Um, and so my mother, you know, taught us how to read. They had a spirit of adventure. My parents, my father applied for a year abroad. Uh, had a few places he had hoped to go, but what was available was a university position in Warsaw. And so that's where we went. Uh, the family packed up, and that became sort of formative for, uh, in a lot of ways, I think, just as far as um, opening up the world. And my earliest memory of going to a museum was when I was three or four. I was put in a Polish uh, nursery school. And I didn't speak Polish, and they did not speak English, and it was kind of terrifying for me because I knew enough English, you know, to know that I couldn't communicate, uh, that they would sort of point and make gestures and speak a couple of words to me. So I kind of ran away from school one day. I was um, four years old, and my mother dropped me off. Um, and I ran after her and indicated that I didn't want to be in school. And so she took me with her and her friend who uh, were going to a museum. And this museum, you arrived and took off your shoes and put on slippers. So it immediately, as a, as a child, this was really special that you were going someplace where they gave you, you know, not like bowling shoes, which I didn't know about obviously then, but, um, but this was a place of comfort and quiet. Uh, it was very special because I was allowed to leave school to be there. Um, so that was one of my earliest exposures to, uh, to art. I majored in fine arts. Um, my senior year, I met my then boyfriend who became my husband, um, and graduated in 1983, and we did, the only advice we got from a teacher of how to proceed was to move to New York and make a go of it. I had a string of odd jobs leading up to moving to New York over the years, um, you know, from babysitting. I was a telephone solicitor uh, in uh, high school. Um, hello, this is Kathy with Econ Carpet Cleaners. Right now we have a special in your area where we can clean your living room, dining room, and hall carpet for only nineteen ninety five, which you'll have to admit is a very reasonable price. That's how it started. My husband was a bicycle messenger. Uh, and it wasn't until the year my mother, we would come up to Maine every year for the holidays and um, when we could in the summers. And my mom got us uh, a chisel, one maybe two, from Liberty Tools, which is the next town over. over. And uh, we sort of didn't fight. We took turns making things with it and taught ourselves how to carve in our apartment um, to the frustration of our neighbors with us pounding on things. <laughs> and, um, and because of those chisels, because of that carving, a few years later, we became very interested in reproduction carving and it became part of this restoration business that we began as we did other odd jobs and has led us to this very day to the company that we still work with all these many years later, um, doing restoration work and museum period room installation 
uh, as a day job, which is still very much informed by you know the skills we learned as artists, the history we learned. Um, and then I've also learned that sometimes how wonderful it is to tackle something really big and break it up into a lot of components and work them back in together. Sometimes it's just the, the sense of space and quiet that I know when I come in here, I also use this space as my yoga studio at the end of the day. Um, that if there's an important work or business conversation, it won't happen in this room. If there's a family argument that is something that needs to be talked about that goes to the kitchen or whatever, that it's a designated space to go to a certain place. Sometimes I come in and I think I, I'm not quite sure what to do. And I say, okay, well, just touch something. Put your hand literally on something, clean up, move something to a different place and react to it. Um, change the lighting, hang up a new curtain, get a different table, uh, keep it moving. Um, so it's something, it's a place that's always, um, that you return to as a comfort and sanctuary, but it's also a place of great movement that you orbit around. Any advice I would give towards anything is to start doing something with no thought of where it's going to take you, but work as if, as if it is the most important thing and honor it with your time. Even if you feel like giving up, honor the time you've put in. Um, make the very most of it. Like um, I was reading a book on, on writing. Uh, part of what I like about writing is that it leads you how to think and you get to hear how other people think. So one author was writing about um, Dickens characters. He said, well, sometimes there are all these minor characters who come in. You've got the main characters, you know who they are. Shakespeare does this too, where a minor character will walk in and deliver some incredible, you know, really memorable line. And he cited uh, one particular person coming in and flipping a coin and something happening with that. And so the, the message was to deliver your lines as if you have a message for the king. And so I think that's part of really fully occupying what you've carved out for yourself.